The Great Commission in Matthew 28 are the go-to verses for disciplers. It says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we stop right there, don't we? And we forget the rest of it because the rest of it says, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. At the first and last word of a disciple of Jesus is obey. This is a quote from a man named Johann Blumhardt. He said, the first and last word for a disciple of Jesus is obey. Of what use is believing if you cannot obey? And John Calvin said, all true knowledge of God is born out of obedience. So how do we teach new believers, new Christians, and then even Christian people who've been Christians for a long time but who have been stagnant? How do we teach people then how to obey? And why is it that some people who claim Christ live vibrant, spirit-filled lives that are fruitful and that continues on, not only in their own family, but in the ministries that they have, and other Christians seem to stagnate and live lives that are unproductive and out without real fruit? Well, let me read to you something that I, I, I like to give out every so often. This is a quote. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough of him to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love my enemy or pick beets with a migrant. I just want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I would like a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Well, it's my contention today that spiritual growth and vibrancy depends upon the believer gaining an appreciation for scripture and developing a consistent study of the word of God. So I'm telling you something that you already know. Peter tells us, the word remember and remind over and over in, one, in his letter. And that's what I'm doing here this morning because what I'm finding out here at the forum is that this very simple method that I have been using and that I have been teaching to women, people are taking home and using. And it's so interesting because I've been doing this for quite a while now, over a dozen years. <clears throat> And for a long time, I wasn't hearing much of anything back. But now I'm seeing people here that are coming to the for forum. A woman that I was mentoring this morning who got her start in this three-step method from somebody that learned it here. So this is spreading. The, it, the beauty of it is the simplicity of it. The simplicity of it, it's so easy to learn, easy to teach. <clears throat> but I always say God puts the cookies on the bottom shelf. It's accessible for all of us. And so that's, uh, it's, that's my contention this morning. And Hans Bayer, in his plenary the other night, said that we need God's revelation to us to restore our ability to reason well, to think, to have true wisdom. It, has, it comes out of Scripture. It's always going to come out of Scripture. But did you know that we only remember 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see and hear together, 70% of what we say as we talk, which means I'm only going to remember 70% of this. But 90% of what we do for ourselves so this is why no one is going to have a vibrant, growing understanding of Scripture by listening to somebody else talk about it. We have to be involved in the text for ourselves. So the Bible is not fast food literature and a day of pop art and quick fixes and immediate gratification. The Bible doesn't always appeal. I, if you've done a lot of discipling, and I'm assuming all of you have, that's why you're in here, what you find is that for some people, the Bible is just not appealing, and it's very difficult to get them to not only get in it, but stay in it and really learn from it. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many times I have come to mentor women 
well, I, that's what I do at home too, is teach and train and, um, and mentor women. And then even when I come here as well, and the women that I'm speaking with are leaders, what I'll find is that when I ask them, what are you studying right now? That's the question I ask every mentoring session. What are you studying right now? So much of the time, what I hear back is, well, I'm, I'm kind of between studies right now. Or I'll hear, well, I'm reading in the Psalms. I'm reading in the Psalms. Uh, or um, they'll say, uh, well, you know, I'm not really doing any kind of a study. Uh, I, I could use a little help with that. It's striking. That's why I started doing what I'm doing, is that these are people who are leading and leading others, but they don't really do a systematic, personal Bible study for themselves. And I'll bet if, there, if I asked in this room, no hands need to be raised, many people here today would, if you were pressed, you would have to admit that you don't actually study the scripture every day that you don't actually have a systematic way of studying. I think often for Christian leaders, and I've been guilty of it myself, that we can allow our study for our ministry to take the place of our own personal Bible study. And we cannot allow our ministry busyness to take the place of the quiet introspection and self-reflection evaluation under the brilliant light of the Word of God. So this is why I recognize, and I hope you will, that the main thing, the main thing that should happen <clears throat> in discipling others should be, it, you should be able to impart the love for the Word of God and the faithful digestion of the Bible. Faithful meaning daily. Um, <clears throat> it's why a believer, every believer, should be able to pick up the Bible and with pen and paper sit down and do their own Bible study. They don't have to have some formal study that someone has translated for them. They can sit down with their own Bible and a piece of paper and a pen and do their own Bible study. Complete with the principles of Scripture that they learn to find in Scripture and the application then that turns it inward how does this apply to me? What does God want from me today? Not just in general. What does he want from me today? Simplistic? Obvious? Yes. But I think we forget that this is the main thing. So obedience comes as we see in Scripture who God is and what he expects of us. It's from Scripture. We learn his character and his attributes. We learn what it is he calls us to do with our lives when we hear from him daily. And so we make progress. We make progress to those vibrant and spirit-filled lives by his grace. I've actually brought it with me, the, the little method that I use. And I, uh, it was in your, on your app. But I don't know if you're like me. You don't print everything out. Right? So would you mind? Uh, how, how many are in here? I think I've got 22 copies. I think we forget sometimes that the people that we're discipling are not like our peers. You know, when we have been Christians for a long time and we've learned to really dig into the Word of God and really digest it, we forget how intimidating it is for a new believer to um, to not only to spend the time, uh, I can remember that, if you'd like one, Jim, I can remember um, as being a new Christian thinking it was just astounding that someone would think I would take a half an hour every morning. <laughs> a half an hour felt like a lot when I was a brand new believer. Really? Half an hour? I'm a young mother, you know, how do I find a half an hour? And um, I think we forget that that's where people start. And this really is brief, it's simple, uh, but it finds the principles of Scripture and it teaches a person then to turn it to themselves so that they, are, they walk out into the day recognizing a challenge from God 
to watch for whatever it is he wants to apply in their life that day. And I can't tell you how many times I'll hear from people later who will say, how, how does he, God know what day I'm going to be on in the scripture and give me exactly what I need for that day? How, how can that happen? But you know, that's something they learn, is that the word of God is supernatural. It's alive. And it reaches them right where they are that day. So um, this, this asks you to find the content. It's the, every, every, everybody's got a three-step method. Have you, have you learned by a three-step method? Well, this one asks you for the content, which is just the facts. You keep it short. Teach they, you teach the person uh, that you're, and, and group that you're mentoring uh, or discipling to keep the content really short. Because if, you, if they think they have to do a lot of writing and uh, writing down, then it becomes a chore and they don't do it. So you keep it really brief. Keep the content short. And then you look for the principle. This is really key. This is, this is the thing that you really want them to learn how to do, to find a truth about God or man or God and man together that's true for all people at all times. And then from that principle, you should be able to then, OK, now it's been here. Now I need to turn the light here on me. And how do I apply it to myself? And so, as you can see, um, I've given you just a little bit of Ruth, and um, and then this uh, it goes through chapter one, and um, and then I would have them continue on in it. And when you finish a short little book like Ruth, they've got it, they've got it. And what happens is they begin to see I can do this in ten or fifteen minutes in the morning. And when I finish the application question, it leads me right into prayer. Because the application is asking something of me. Because it's telling me that I can't answer the question by yes or no. That's one of the things that I write there in the application, is that they should not be able to answer the question by yes or no. Because if they can say yes or no, it's way too easy. <clears throat> and so they, they, should be, they should ask themselves, how have I or when have I uh, so that it it makes them think a little more. And when they've asked themselves a couple of questions, then they it, they lead that leads right into a sense of, oh, I'm going to need help with this, Lord. I'm going to need you to help me with this today. And so they go out into the day with a sense of expectation. It maybe not at first, they think, well, I don't I'm not sure how this is going to work. But day after day as they do this, they're going to come they're going to come, out of their day saying, yes, he, he prepared me ahead for what took place in my day. So simple, yep, obvious, yep, but this is integral. This is integral in discipling. Uh, and if anybody wants any uh, more information on that little three-step method, I'd be happy to talk about it later. Passing on. Passing on. Would you, would you like to go next? Sure. Let's do you can, I don't know. Sure. Is it okay? Uh, my name is Jello Paul. I serve uh, in a multi-site uh, church launched about 18 years ago, designed for college students. And it's basically as a result of the work of Navigator's Crusade early, late 70s in Romania. Um, there are five steps that I believe are cr critical for what I, what I think this um, seminar defines as multiplying disciple-making church. And um, I uh, would start with my, the first discovery that I made working with Crusade. Uh, it had to do with uh, Frank Yana's model of education. It's more like a purpose-driven model of education. It was late 85, which is um, an individual who changes the worldview has to develop a biblical perspective of life and ministry. It sounds complicated, but it's not. It's really helping a person know that he is there under God, he lives for God, and the one who died for him requires of him or her to live for Christ. So that is a one-year-long process that I think it's important uh, to take a new convert because people convert, but their worldview and their system of thinking stays the same. And then 20 years later, you figure out the drop-off rate, and you don't know why. 
the second practice I think it's critical for uh, the for a multiplying the discipleship is to integrate lifestyle discipleship in the local church. And this is again a one year long process. We've taken churches and uh, leaders through where uh, they understand that discipleship is not an appendix to the church, is the core thing the church is to be doing. And when the church embraces this, the church is really growing. The next practice, which is inevitable, is to share leadership. You have disciples, they're becoming leaders, you have to provide environments, you have to provide opportunities. The fourth, which is more painful, and I've gone through it for nine months lately, and I was more than glad to quit, uh, is um, managing growth. If you have a biblical perspective of life and ministry and serve it, God will somehow bless it. It doesn't have to be the same percentage in everywhere. But then you make disciples, they grow, you have leaders, you share leadership, and you have to manage growth. Growth can be plus or minus, you know. And the last one, I think, has to do with developing a, a um, global impact church perspective. You have to move beyond your location, beyond your country, ethnic group, and so on. And um, there's more, much more I was th initially thinking to share, but there's one more thing at the second uh, practice that I think it's important, is how do we, do, how do we make disciples? I, th I think the church has failed in the last several centuries in uh, keying on preaching without follow-up. If there's anything that we, if there's any way we harm the church is to transform them or uh, vegetabilize them as a result of their uh, practice, just to come into the church and feed in and feed out, and then you're no longer able to do anything through the week. And there's very way, there's ways you have to, and you can change that, and one, and I try to put it in English, it's a little more, this is not uh, complicated, but it's not very simple either. In English, it would sound like this, time-bound, systematic transformation of biblical teaching. And this goes in, it's a limited in time, it's normally in one-to-one -one or in a small group, and it takes people through basics. What are the basic steps until somebody becomes victorious? Uh, there are nine steps, or 10, or 15, or whatever. How, you can take crusade, navigators, you can build your own. But when somebody c cultivates a daily progressive relationship with the Lord, and discovers the voice of the Lord, and shares the, what he's learned, and we've done statistics and then surveys in the church with people who've done that. It's impressive. You know, we have 90% of people who read the Bible weekly and 75% that read the Bible and meet the Lord every day. So that has to do with the follow-up. You know, session, conferences, forget about it, in three days. If you don't follow up, people are not going to change habits and so on. And it's very interesting. Jesus' mission seems to be more like uh, behavioral than uh, cognitive transformation. You teach them to do what's right. And yeah, you have to avoid legalism, you have to avoid liberalism, but that's what Jesus says. And then the second way we do this, because this is like uh, short, uh, it's just like limited in time, the second one is lifelong, uh, whole counsel of God, uh, transformational biblical teaching. And we do this in two ways. First of all, we preach. Initially, when we started, I had a team of six people who prepared the sermon together for 18 years. Now we have 12 people who preach in our, in our churches. And uh, we have learned from Reformation that the Bible is to be interpreted in community. And that's the strength of a church that does learn not to isolate, but to dialogue, dialogical preaching. The second thing is how chur how's church? Uh, from the beginning, when we plan the church, we ask the question, what is the mission? Discipleship, how can you make disciples? Well, uh, we, have learned, we have to learn from university because we have created university. If you don't go to, to uh, courses, you're not, uh, not going to be able to graduate. There's seminars, there's labs. So you have to create learning environments where people change mindset, perspectives, skills, and character. So we do preach, and then the next Sunday we have house churches. We started with five, no, six. Uh, 18 years later, we have 40 house churches where uh, more than 60 elders and uh, leaders serve a church life in a small kind of environment that takes five hours where we worship, we pray, we are accountable, we study the word, we discover the truth, we apply the truth, we are accountable, we put money into the church, and we also eat together, we feast together. Thank you. Very good, okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, thank you. Um, my name is Jim Cece, I'm the senior pastor teacher at Campus Bible Church in Fresno, it's right between 
Los Angeles and Sacramento, right in the navel of California. So it's good to be here. My wife, Karen, is here as well. She's in your network, so she has been filling me in on what she's been learning and learning so much that she's going to teach her husband later on these things. We've been pastoring for 44 years, and um, one of the things that I've always reacted to is me flying thousands of miles to come and tell you what to do, because I can't do that. We've had the privilege of having not only three adopted daughters, but 23 foster children, uniquely made by God, with varying backgrounds and histories and challenges, just like our congregations. And I believe that ministering in a congregation of people is like raising children. They're uniquely and marvelously made by God with all the personality attributes that need to be uniquely dealt with. There are some basic principles in scriptures. And what we wrestled with as a church, and I won't go into the size of our church or the, you know, who we, what we do, because that's not important, because I've, I've ministered in small churches, I've ministered in medium-sized churches, and I've ministered in what you would determine as perhaps larger, even mega churches. I'm not impressed. Mark Twain said, thunder is impressive, but it's lightning that does the work. <laughs> I'm not impressed with programs. I'm not impressed with size. If we want to talk size, look at the growth of the cults in the world. I had cancer on my nose. It was growing. They cut it off. They saved my nose and my jaw. Growth is not impressive. It can be cancerous growth. I'm impressed not with the growth of my children, but with the health of my children. There's a difference. I didn't have to promote growth. I just fed my children. I equipped my children. I educated my children. Every once in a while, I had to discipline my children. And they grew up. And now they're helping their children grow up. I believe that proper growth is a result of health. So I am more committed to church health than I am church growth. In all of our churches, I am committed to health. And so we as elders began to wrestle through, what does a healthy Christian look like? You know, you know that we've had foster children that had the bodies of 12-year-olds and the minds of 4-year-olds. So just because they look more mature, they may not be. So it is with churches. We've had foster children that were 8 years old that had the minds of 12-year-olds because of their experiences. So we can't look at externals anymore. It's time for a moratorium on the whole idea of church growth apart from church health, in my opinion. So we as elders began to wrestle through, how do you measure health? And we, we came up with some words that you all know. And then we had to uniquely, in our local churches, operationally define each one of these for us. You all know these words. Uh, you know, we call them the seven marks of health at Campus Bible Church. The first is fellowship. We wanted our people to have significant contact with other believers outside of the corporate worship assemblies. Fellowship, you know the word. Doctrine, we wanted our people to be able to defend the faith. And we had to develop our programs uniquely, as you'll have to do, in equipping your people and how to stand against false teaching. Fellowship, doctrine, the next one was worship. We wanted our people to respond to God's majesty. It's not about music. It's about what we call wow-ship, looking at creation and saying, wow, celebrating the majesty of God in all kinds of ways. So fellowship, doctrine, worship. The next one was service. We wanted our people to understand that they've not only been talented but gifted by God. So we needed to develop our own unique programs, not adopt anybody else's, use them, but make them campus Bible church-ish like you'll have to do in terms of identifying their spiritual gifts, how to use their talents, how to use their time and their treasures, how to use the things that God gives us as resources. And so fellowship, doctrine, worship, and service. The next one was evangelism. How to locate and pick ripened fruit, ripened by the Spirit of God. How to identify, how to deal with the problem that people have in coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and so we had to design methods and programs and borrow from everybody in the world that we could, like folks like you. Because we don't assume we know the answer just because we live across the pond. 
And so we are very much adaptive and adoptive as a church because we have to be. Fellowship, doctrine, worship, service, evangelism, then discipleship. We define that as becoming like Jesus. Uh, and lots of passages that you could address in that. And we had to then develop how to do that. And the last one was prayer. Prayer. What does it look like to be a praying people? What does it look like to be a praying family? And so now when, I'm, when my staff comes in for a staff meeting, I don't ask them how many people did you have in your youth retreat? Or how many did we have at our choir retreat? Or how many came? Here's what they're to tell me as they evaluate and what they're defined by is tell me about how healthy that event was. Was it healthy in the area of fellowship, doctrine, worship, service, evangelism, discipleship, and prayer? Those are the measurements. I don't want to count noses and dollars. I want to know that our people are growing because they're healthy. And we have a philosophy that says come, grow, and then go. We don't want you to stay at Campus Bible Church. We want you to go. Go where God wants you to go. And we'll help you. Go well if you go, but go. Where do we get all that? In, in a couple of minutes, I want to tell you what transformed my ministry. It was the tiniest little book in the New Testament of the pastoral epistles, and that's the book of Titus. And if I could do it all over again in 44 years of ministry, I would take every minister and I'd have them memorize the book of Titus. I have, because I had to. Why? Because it lays the standard. Paul assigns Titus to go into the island of Crete because the church was falling apart. They had come to Christ 30 years earlier on the day of Pentecost, and now the church was in chaos, and it needed one thing, soundness. The Greek word means health. Soundness. I want sound churches. So Titus was given the job to go in to that island that Homer called the island of 100 towns, and the first thing he says in chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, and very quick, I'm going to go through this, is that you need to be a faith builder and a knowledge builder. You need to produce what is lacking, find what it needs, and then build leadership, chapter 1, verse 5 through 9, 5 through 7, and deal with false teachers, chapter, nine, chapter 1, 9, verses the end of the chapter. And then he says in chapter 2, verse 1, and teach sound, healthy doctrine. That's what you were saying, my brother. And then he said, you be generational. Chapter 1, chapter 2, verses 2 and following, where I want older men to build younger men and to make them saffron, uh, sensible. The one thing he says of all of those. And I want older women to teach younger women saffronizo, to have some plain sense about doing life. And so we began what we called a men's academy. Our philosophy is to build our church on the back of strong men. It changed the face of our church. Because in 1 Corinthians 16, he says, I want you to be andridzomai. I want you to act like men. Because I found that we had a feminized Christianity. I'm not opposed to it. I love what you're doing with the, old, with the women. I do. We have that. But I found that uh, women were easier. The men were harder. You had to beg them to come to a retreat. They could have $100 in their wallet. They'd rather go to a sporting event, and they'll tell you they can't afford to go to a men's retreat. You tell the women, you gather together, they'll, they'll meet at a dung heap as long as you serve tea. <laughs> and we found that. So I needed to build the, back, uh, the church on the back of strong men. It changed the face of our church. Uh, and, I, uh, and if you want to ask me at the table how we did it, it absolutely was a miracle of God. It changed the face of our church. I will tell you this practically. When you train the men, you bring the women and the children along. People are coming to a campus Bible church by family unit rather than by individual women coming and begging their husbands to come. And it changed, and I say this before God and by his grace, it changed the face of our church, which is what Titus taught or was taught by Paul. Older men teaching younger men, older women teaching younger women. And then he goes on to talk about the standard, which is what? The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And all the godly living stuff that goes beyond that. Teaching workers how to work. Uh, he also does in Titus 2. And of course, in Titus 3, all that godly living stuff. It changed the face of our church. You can't adopt somebody's program without incarnating it in your own family, 
in your own church, in your own community. So I'm going to say publicly, forgive us across the pond for bringing our piles of programs and suggesting if you just copy this, that you will have health. It would be like me coming into your family saying, let me tell you how to raise your children. I've learned some things. I'm glad to share anything we have. You go to campusbiblechurch.com, anything we have is yours. And if we can adapt it, adopt it, do whatever we can, we're here to help you. Thank you so much.